indication of the effects of an electric field, permeability is the indication, is the quantification of the effects of a magnetic field. Well, what if it wasn't in that context? I feel like permeability and permeability have, have uh, their own separate meanings. It's yeah, the definition, when I've looked up permittivity, it is the, not the exact wording, but it's basically uh, how, indication of how a dielectric is affected by an electric field. And so permeability would be how, not a dielectric, but how a material is affected by a magnetic field. Because some mediums can enhance a magnetic field. So there's an experiment that you'll do in a couple of weeks where you'll have an iron rod that you, you put an iron rod into an experiment and you get much stronger magnetic fields than without it. And that's the effect of the permeability of the, or steel, whatever the material is. Okay, that makes sense. So you always give us that caution. Yeah. We do more with permittivity than we do with permeability. All right, other questions before I ask my question about the math here. What can I consider constant in the math problem? I heard somebody say something. I said not. All right, use of knots constant, so we'll pull that one out. Anything else constant? Okay. Anything else constant? Is the radius constant? Radius, this R here would be the distance from the wire. Yeah. The so wire is not constant. What about height? No, because that equation. Yeah. However, and that's why I was getting to that question. I is a function of what variable? T. T. Yes. Is I a function of the area? No. Okay, so, so in this context, since we are taking a derivative with respect to area, I comes out also. It will be affected here when we do the derivative with respect to time, but at this point, we're good. And so all I'm left with is dA over R. There's more than one way of looking at this. I'm just gonna take a strip right there, some distance R away. The thickness of this is dr. So my area of this infinitesimally thin line right here is just my thickness dr times that length right there. And so I'm just gonna make this, I'm gonna call that a and b, and c, why not? So dA is just, um, little a dr. In essence, it's going to be one meter times whatever that thickness right there is. So it's going to use of not i a equals two pi integral dr over r. I now have my integral in terms of a single variable. R is going to go from c to b. Even though we have to find my variable letters over there. And so we get mu naught i a over 2 pi. And then the integral of dr over r. It's ln r. And c to b. And so we get mu naught i a over 2 pi natural log of b over c. I've made some unfortunate choices in letters here. Because we have uh, A for area, A for ampere, and a little A for length. So my EMF, I've now got an equation over there. I'm taking a derivative with respect to time. B, C, little, little B, little C, little A, U naught, 2 pi are all constants with respect to time. 
So this becomes u naught i little a, oops, scratch that, u naught little a over 2 pi times the natural log of b over c times the i t. And i is equal to that. So ddt of 3 times 1 minus e to the negative t. Is what? 3e to the t? Yeah, that's what I think. Close, negative t. Yeah. So this becomes u naught a little a over 2 pi, natural log b over c times 3e to the negative t. And now we can plug in numbers. Uh, I didn't give you anything that's specific for time, so we'll end up with a function here. But mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative seventh in SI units. A is 1 meter over 2 pi times the natural log of 9, uh, 0.9 over 0.5 times 3 times e to the negative t. And so we'll have some number right here. Occasionally I'll have students who get to this point and they'll just leave it like that. Please come up with a number. Use a calculator. I'll hand you a slide rule if it's in class and you want to use a slide rule. You want to use an abacus. Sorry, I should have a lot. Use of not is four pi times ten to the negative seven. I got three point five three times ten to the negative seven. Anyone else? We got the same. Okay. Yeah. Sounds well too. All of a sudden, you're looking like uh, you questioned something. Not sure. All right. Assuming that this is right, uh, what's the unit of this coefficient? Voltage. If this is an ideal wire, what's the current running through it? This being the ideal wire. This is the ideal wire. This rectangle is ideal wire. What's the current? Yeah, what's the resistance of the ideal wire? Zero. So what would the current be if there's no resistance? Zero. Yeah. Okay. 
So sometimes on these problems, I uh, then give you a resistance and ask you what is the actual current. Like, do we need to know the resistance, or at least enough information to find the resistance? I could tell you. I gave you dimensions of the length and width. If I told you the thickness of it, of the wire and the material, you should be able to from the material find the resistivity, and you can calculate resistance that way. But not doing that right now. So e to the negative t is unit length. Pardon? Like e to the negative t is unit length? Yes. Because remember that e to the x is equal to 1 plus uh, e to the 0 over 0 factorial, e to the first over 1 factorial plus e squared over 2 factorial plus e to the root factorial. I'm trying to remember if that was there or not. Uh, and so on. So if you took the derivative, if this had units, if, if that had units, then you'd have that unit to the first unit squared, unit cubed, and so forth, and it'd be un unmanageable. So this should be unitless. Does that make one series? Pardon? Does that make one series? Yeah, that or Taylor, I always get those two backwards. It's quite possibly McLaurin. Uh, there is one other thing about the units here. Uh, technically, this should have been technically over one second just to make that unit was. I got sloppy in my notation. Other questions? All right, I'm gonna count this as another victory because I remembered the question that I was gonna answer for Mario. So let's do that now, instead of getting halfway through another problem and remembering. I have a contained area here with a magnetic field. And I have a loop of wire here that is moving into it. So we've got a couple scenarios here. Assume that my long rectangular box is a magnetic field with a magnetic field coming out of the board. Uh, instead of my having to draw dots every single time, this is this. Go with the spirit of what I'm doing here. So we have before it enters, as it's entering, while it's in the middle of it, and as it exits. So the question is, while before it gets there, what is the direction of the induced current? I heard two voices at once. Oh, I was going to say counterclockwise. I was going to say clockwise. And fine. Anyone else? We have clockwise, counterclockwise. I guess there's really only three choices clockwise, counterclockwise, and no current. Let's see if democracy works. Clockwise, counterclockwise, or no. Nah. Right, have a gut feeling. Even if you can't, don't know why it is, just have a feeling about what it is. All right, so clockwise. Counterclockwise. No current. A voice of one. <laughs> Precious, why did you say no current? I feel like I studied this before and my gut says it's no current. All right, just based on some memory of something in the past? Yeah, okay. But, yeah. Uh, argument for, just I'm going backwards here, counterclockwise. Well, I'm going like this since um, it's coming out of the board, right? This, this magnetic field is coming out of the board. You're changing your mind, or you can't quite articulate. Yeah, I'm sure now. Okay. Uh, someone else. There were two other. Kyle, what are you so, saying? Uh, this coming out of the board. So the, the induced current in this is counterclockwise to match the magnetic field here. 
Don't forget that negative side. I was thinking that's why you're saying about the opposite. Yeah, I like to change my answer. I think to <laughs> clockwise. Clockwise. Yeah. Your gut feeling. <laughs> All right. And the answer is. Oh, I didn't ask someone. What, like, what's the the clockwise answer? Sorry, I forgot to ask. There were at this point five people who say clockwise. Didn't have a gut feeling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I did ask for a review. I had a gut feeling. What is this? All right. So let's actually talk about the Faraday's law again. Faraday Lenz's law. That the induced EMF negative d phi b dt. So before it gets into, don't forget that magnetic field is contained. Okay. So it, what is the change in the magnetic flux at this point? Therefore, what is the current? Okay. There is no current before it gets into it. Bring my memory is current. <laughs> I, see. I, I was like, my gut's telling me clockwise, but I have a feeling it, it'll have something to do with uh, the magnetic flux being contained. So yes, it does. <laughs> and again, I think I mentioned this last time. This is somewhat realistic to actually be able to contain a magnetic field at this point in our technology. All right, so now that it enters, this is now a different ball game here, it is now entering, we got clockwise, counterclockwise, and nah. Gut feeling, who says it's going to be clockwise? Or counter, or again, three choices, give you a moment to put it together. a couple people there who didn't feel like they wanted to offer an opinion. I'm going to go with clockwise. Same. Clockwise. I think, Jesse, you're the... That's a counterclockwise. Just keep it in? Yeah. And... Uh, I, I will agree. There is a current, so this, this, I'm not going to put it that way. All right, so let's go back to the basics there. Is the magnetic flux increasing or decreasing? Okay, apparently, let's drop back a little bit more. Magnetic flux. B dot dA. It would be increasing. Why is it increasing? Because it's adding more area. Yeah, all right. So my magnetic flux is increasing, so my induced current wants to decrease it. It wants to do the opposite. So is my magnetic flux here going to, yeah, so is, I want to put a current so that it will oppose the magnetic field. Yeah. Clockwise. If it's going counterclockwise, then it's going to create a current, uh, create a magnetic field in the middle, the same direction as the external magnetic field, and nature hates that. Um, what's the thing moving inside again? Wait, what is this? Yeah. It's just a, it's a loop of wire that's moving in. Oh. Something where I've got a connection. That was pretty much the reasoning that I went with, because like with the other one, um, when you were giving the explanation about the counterclockwise, where it was coming out of the board and going counterclockwise, but opposite um, with the uh, EMF, that's why I said clockwise. Okay. All right. Getting more comfortable with this, I hope. What's the direction of the induced current here? Zero. Why? Because it's in it. It's in, it's in the magnetic field. Like, what was it then? 
Okay. So the magnetic field, the area is constant here. The magnetic field is constant. Yeah, there's no current here. And as it leaves, Keep going. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I, I would debate the word less there. That's the key thing. It's decreasing the area. Uh, decreasing area causes a decrease in what? Make magnetic flux. Yeah, nature hates the change. So if the like, magnetic flux is getting smaller, it wants to try to help increase it. It wants to do the opposite. And so the current would flow, oh wait, it's going out, yeah. The current would flow counterclockwise to increase the magnetic field in the middle. Most of the time, all you're doing is just slowing the, slowing the change. So basically it's just, like whenever in situations like that, the EMF is trying to keep the magnetic flux at an equilibrium. Yes. And it is possible to do this. Questions before I talk about the case where it actually will, where you actually can break even. All right, so breaking even. I have some piece of metal right here, and I have a magnet right here. That magnet is created as a magnetic field that flows from it, and I'll just assume that the magnetic field is flowing this way. So if I just have the magnet, I'm holding a magnet above this piece of metal, this uh, metal track or something like that, I, there's no induced current because the magnetic flux isn't changing from holding it. But as soon as I let go, I let go of the magnet, that magnet starts to fall. Therefore, I have a change in the magnetic flux in this metal track. The magnet, the, because I have a change in the magnetic flux of the metal track, it creates a current. It create, induces an EMF, which creates a current. The current in this metal track then is going to try to oppose the change, and so it's going to create a magnetic field in the opposite direction at that point because as it's falling, getting closer to my north end here, my magnetic field is increasing. And so it's gonna to try to oppose that. So if that's my north end there, my south end there, my induced current's gonna create a north and south pole there, which is gonna repel this magnet. Now, under ordinary situations, if I took a magnet and I dropped it towards one of the metal tracks, it would fall. However, here, if I dropped it, if I have no resistance down here, it's going to create a current which will oppose it and so the magnet's going to start to fall and then it'll get repelled and so it'll come back up to the point where it stops in which case the magnetic flux is no longer changing and therefore my current goes away and it'll start to fall again and as soon as it starts to fall it'll create a current which will then oppose it and you basically will have it float so we can levitate yes we can as long as this is superconducting if this is a superconducting material and that magnet's light enough we can get it to float. That's exciting. It, it is really cool. Is that the magnet chain? I don't think it is. I, because I, I've seen this uh, um, decades ago. I, I saw the magnet hovering over the small track. At this point, um, I've seen it where you actually have a relatively large track, I mean, tabletop size track, and you can put the magnet on it, like magnet, and you can push it along, and the thing will zip around the track. Stay levitated. Does that have to be super cold? Yeah, and that's the well, trick. The maglev we... trains, in order for that to be this principle, is you would need to have uh, the entire track basically at the liquid nitrogen temperatures. To oh, so Siberia. Or... Yeah, <laughs> in, in wintertime, Siberia is their set. <laughs> so, what is the principle behind the maglev train? Um, it is still the, it is still repelled. I think it is electromagnets. Oh. Is it basically just like lightening the train 
in order to move it faster? It's keeping it off the track okay. because the air resistance, it, I mean, you can streamline it. Uh, my understanding of the maglev trains is that the, the savings is that you don't have, basically you don't have metal on metal. You don't have wheels slipping yeah. like you would have on a regular train. Well, well, you got air resistance yeah. still. Okay. Now, is, I don't think I the track the is, <clears throat> I don't think it's inducing a current that way. I think it has magnets of its own. And you can then time it so that the, I mean, if they're electromagnets, you can just turn the electricity on when the train's coming and then turn them off when the train's gone by. Mm -hmm. I think they are doing, uh, I know there's been a lot of research into like uh, room temperature superconductors. Uh, I, I think there's been some movement in that field too, but I don't know enough about it. <laughs> there was a huge breakthrough in 87. There was this, the, this meeting where they actually revealed the, the biggest jump in temperature. So it used to be you know, closer to absolute zero and then there, and, mid 80s they got this big jump and so now we can use liquid nitrogen which is relatively cheap compared to what we were using and they had this meeting called the woodstock of physics i wasn't part of the naming committee <laughs> it was nerd heaven uh and at that point it seemed like oh but that huge break would you know as a, they raised the temperature like 50 degrees celsius uh in what was required to get to work on activity. And they thought, oh, we've got this huge breakthrough. It's only a matter of time before we get room temperature. And at this point, room temperature only happens in Siberia and Alaska in the wintertime. Uh, and at that point, so you get this big jump and then it's basically plateaued the last time I looked. I don't know if there's uh, been a more recent breakthrough. Yeah, there, this article that I found uh, says, first room temperature super, superconductor excites and baffles scientists. It was, uh, October 2020. Oh, okay. Um, don't know where it's based out of, but um, basically it says uh, it's a material made from hydrogen, carbon, and sulfur, um, and it demonstrates uh, it says seems to conduct electricity without any resistance at temperatures of up to about 15 degrees Celsius. Wow. See if it says anywhere about where it is. And also the size is the my question. It's just Ashes and Peters. You know the last one did too. Okay, because 15 degrees Celsius is roughly 60 degrees Fahrenheit ish. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure exactly where it is, but uh I think one of the things that's making it difficult to uh, be feasible is that it requires high pressure conditions. Ah, okay. But still. Yeah, it's, I guess, easier to get the high pressure conditions than it is to uh, keep things cool. Yeah, I would, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, because you just create a large space and then shrink it. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, who can't do that, take a room and then make right. it, suddenly make a smaller one, keeping it airtight. Okay, well, that's exciting. I'm sorry I missed it. All right, so that goes back to your original question of, is it always in the opposite direction? No, it's not always in the opposite direction. If the magnetic flux is decreasing, it's going to be in the same direction. If the magnetic flux is increasing, it'll be opposite. Back to the 
simple stuff. Uh, I am going to find a section in my notes because I have done this before where I started going in circles. So I have charge building up on here. I got negative charges building up on this side, positive charges building up on that side. If they're an ideal capacitor, all the electric field is in the middle and there's no electric field outside it. So if I think about that, I've got, that's my positive and negative. I have an electric field traveling in this direction. That's my electric field. And my electric field outside is zero. So we'll stick with the nice ideal case to start with. I'm going to create a Gaussian surface around the plate. So I've got a plate here, and I'm just imagining that there's some surface surrounding it. What is the electric field that is generated? Parallel plate capacitor. What's the electric field in between? Sigma divided by epsilon. All right. And what is sigma? P over A. If I take the time derivative, I get PQ. Uh, whatever A epsilon is not or constant, so I'll just hold those out. So if A times P E D T is equal to whatever epsilon is not PQ D T, just multiply both sides times the area. So 